morning, everybody. Welcome to the Fair Job Network podcast. No Steve today, it's just me and our very special guest today, um, who has been a great support and friend to date to our venture and channel. And this is uh, the very excellent Barry Wall. Barry, how the devil are you? I'm tickety-boo, as they say, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. Tickety-boo. Yeah, it's good to speak with you. So today we're going to be talking about um, building um, building workplaces that we want to work in. And um, we'll start that in a minute. In the meantime, just some general housekeeping. First of all, my usual groveling apology for the piss poor quality of our video. Well, not Barry's, obviously, but mine. Um, as you know, Steve and I have just started with this uh, video podcast, Malarkey. And uh, it's a little bit of a learning curve, which obviously is all linked to budgets. So if you don't like our camera, give us some money so we can buy a better one. And I can justify it from Mrs. Palmer, which would be, be nice. Anyway, without further ado, Steve is not here today. He sends his apologies. I'm um, very, very uh, 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 glad to be uh, speaking to Barry. And um, Barry, for our readers who don't know who you are, do you want to give us a quick bio? Yeah, well, certainly. Um, I'm a I'm an aging pillow in the autumn of his years, <laughs> as are so many of us these days who are involved in this. Um, I work predominantly for myself now, and uh, occasionally for businesses and other organisations, in teaching uh, around uh, the sort of the sort of thinking that a company needs to have these days in order to avoid, to avoid themselves being politicised and getting caught up in what is, quite frankly, the most awful template of thinking that is perpetrated firstly the corporates via the universities and then uh, is now leaking down to small to medium enterprises, which is the lifeblood of, of the UK. From my perspective, I have a, 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 I'm an activist. I have a character called the YouTube, the YouTube Jester, which is the EDI Jester on YouTube, which is an outrageous character that speaks truth to power and doesn't care what anybody thinks. But I also run a programme called The Winning Mindset, for warrior teachers, which is aimed at people who wish to improve their general ability in the in a world that's steeped in information and then which we have to make into knowledge. So I'm really culturally sort of trying to help folk work through and understand how we function well from an organizational or a business perspective, as well as a personal perspective in a world with so many nonsense distractions that seem to be screaming for the time of business or of any given organisation. So that's it in a nutshell. I've been a teacher for 40 years. I've been in the NHS. I've been in the, the civil service. I've been in some of the biggest companies in the country and I've done individual coaching. So I've been across the board. I've pretty seen, pretty much seen most of it, Richard, to be fair. And to see what's currently going on is extremely concerning. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And uh, I mean, certainly one of the things, I mean, well, the reason why Steve and I set Fair Job Network up and the Fair Job Initiative up was to try and give people who are running uh, or employing anyone or running small businesses in particular some guidance around how the hell you navigate the modern world, uh, particularly a world that is so divided, uh, so partisan, and so angry all the time. Um, you add a few other wild, um, wild swinging balls into that, from a cricket term, that is, Barry. You know, I hope you understand. But you add a few a few googlies into that, and then you've got the situations like COVID to deal with, which has been a very tough, particularly on smaller businesses. You've seen a massive wealth transfer from small businesses to large businesses thanks to ham-fisted government policies. And you've genuinely got an, an, an environment which has been created by politicians under pressure from uh, lobbying groups which caters for the requirements of large employers whilst ignoring those of smaller employers at a time when we're still the nation of shopkeepers that Bonaparte talked about because 62% of people in Britain work in small to medium enterprises, which is organisations yeah. under 250 people, just for the definition. Yeah. And 99.9% .9 of British businesses are small to medium business, uh, enterprises. So yeah. um, it, it strikes me that, again, just as we see in the macro political situation where you've got uh, politicians who aren't really reflecting the views of the, of the voter. You've got a whole business infrastructure that doesn't actually service the businesses that, 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 uh, that, 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 that uh, or provide laws, provide guidance on how, how small businesses are meant to operate when they are the majority. 
I think Mrs. Badnock is doing some good work. I think mm -hmm. she recognizes the problem, but as always, we see um, the, uh, 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 the, the the ball and chain that is the civil service around the ankles of politicians. And mm -hmm. we're now looking at a Labour majority. And um, Steve and I will be looking this week, actually. Steve's at the moment, he's doing doing his homework on what the Labour policies are towards business and how they might actually impact the workplace. Um, and there's, you know, there's issues here around things like zero hours contracts, um, which, you know, if they use properly are very uh, you know, great ways of, of building flexible uh, lifestyles for people. But if they use badly, yeah. they can be seen to exploit people. But, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of complexity here. And I think that what small businesses don't need is they don't need to be managing all that and then having to be, uh, you know, they've already got to be an accountant. They've already got to be a lawyer. They've already got to be a health and safety specialist. They've already got to be a salesman. They've already got to be a marketing person and a chef or a plumber or whatever other their business is. And then on top of that, they're now meant to be social workers. They're meant yep. to be arbiters of, of political discourse. They're meant to be political yep. activists. So, you know, where do we go? And, and, and Fair Job was set up to do exactly what you're doing here. And this is why I think that, you know, we're so glad that we've, we've come across you and that we've been able to link with you because there's this common ground all over here. We need to restore sanity back to the workplace. And I think that when people, when, when you get cultural issues, people look for people to blame. And one of the things that we're picking up on is that there seems to be a perception, especially with smaller employers and smaller businesses, that uh, the uh, that, that, that new ideas coming into the into the workplace from young employees and young workers are actually causing some of these problems. And this is creating a resistance around recruiting young people. Now, it may be perception or it may be facts that are driving this. I think there are some arguments on both sides of the fence here. But you and I were talking earlier, Barry, about how actually this isn't just limited to young people, that there are some real problems with, with people of all, of all ages. Well, I would say to you, I would push back on that particular narrative. The youngest person that I know that is involved in this up to their neck is in their 40s, remembering that this particular way of thinking, which involves a kind of anti-meritocracy, anti-reality stance on many things, has been going since the late 1980s. So I would disagree that it's young people who are predominantly doing this. If you look to who are causing most of the problems, I'm afraid to say that it is HR. That are causing most of those problems could be more predominantly people are those who are in their 40s who are the heads of those particular parts of any given organization so i would say that young people are not necessarily to blame but i would also say that businesses are a bit stuck because finding the right people is difficult that when somebody comes along they want to pamper to them and i use the word pamper deliberately people keep saying to me you mean pander no i don't i mean pamper right because that's what you feel like you're doing now in addition to that, you've had the likes of Stonewall, who have infected the education system and infected the business arena, who are a deeply homophobic organisation, there's no getting away from it, who have beliefs that are literally crackpot, that any business that, that isn't in the milieu, that doesn't know about this, is going to think, well, that looks like a good thing, I'll do that. It's a, it's a disastrous thing to do, is to get involved in any of this. So to a certain degree, uh, yeah, to a certain degree, businesses businesses need to do a a real rethink and a reorientation around their provision for learning for their employees. And I've mentioned this to you before, so I'm I'm more than happy to mention it again now. Is that we've got to stop thinking about the word training and we've got to start thinking about the word education, because these young people have been told that things are a certain way when they're not. These young people have been told that meritocracy is a terrible thing and that you have to be an anti-racist or you have to be a believer in transgenderism or you have to be a believer in whatever they pick. And they've been told that. But in fact, we know it's not true. And the truth will out. And young people are craving guidance and leadership right now. I genuinely believe that when we look back at this through history, it will say it was a time when the young people were calling to the adults for help and guidance and the adults didn't give it. So it's time to get the adults back in the room. But that means that the small to medium enterprises are going to have to get their head around the fact that they're going to need to do ongoing, regularised learning for all their employees in order to ascertain and keep in place the principles that make small to medium enterprises successful. 
So we know, because we've been there and done that and got the T-shirt, meritocracy, collaboration, compassion, and working together to the common aim of the business is the single most important philosophy that any business can have. Now, if that philosophy is turned on its head, which it has been, it's not meritocracy. It's all about whether you're a discriminated group and they bring in power and oppression narratives into the workplace. That business is finished. So it's absolutely vital that business gets their head around the fact that they need to do it should be firstly part of their induction. And secondly, that should then be ongoing with the staff once a month, for example, over sustained periods of time. And it should be done in a way that means that the employees can take part in this particular program, but it's not necessarily part of the company. And the reason I'm saying that is because we have a politicization problem and to get them to get the company out of that problem, then we must begin a cultural kind of education, which enables the individual to see above all that and therefore commit to what they need to do at work, but learn at the same time, which can also help them elsewhere in their life. So in other words, it's like a continuation of education from the school system and from the universities. And I don't see any way around this other than doing that. That's where I'm at with it. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things that um, we're trying to urge small businesses to, to understand, and it's one of the reasons why we've built our, our commercial model to be as accessible as accessible as possible to the smallest of employer is that you can't rely on the tropes of society to uh, create the idea of um, I'm at work. This is how we're going to behave at work anymore. It, 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 it's not there anymore. You actually, as a business owner, can't just assume that your workers, whatever, however they old they are, are going to come to work with that focus you actually have to create it and you do and so this is what i mean on being on top of everything else accountant bean counter pot washer whatever you're now having to do this so what we're trying to do and what we're, what we're working through with barry here as well is is trying to work out how we can provide some very very easy tools and some very straightforward uh, straightforward solutions to building this resilience within your business because once you start looking at employment contracts once you start going talking about uh, grievances and disciplinaries that's it it's too late you've gone you've lost that person and as barry said to me earlier when we were talking about this earlier you know if your business is, is employing you know anything under sort of 15 or 20 people all you need is one bad egg all you need is one activist one bullshy employee and it's all over one thing i have noticed barry is um and and this is something i've picked up on since we launched uh, Fair Job, I knew it was out there, but I wasn't aware of just how ingrained it has become, is the uh, Marxist-Leninist idea that human communication, interaction between humans, is all about power and all about getting one over on someone else and putting your foot on their throat. And, yeah, that's... and I'm really picking this up from a lot of people I speak to, especially academics, they seem to think this is default. They seem to think there's consensus on this. Well, the consensus on this has come from academia. That's the first thing. So academics at the moment seem to me to be generally in three camps. Those brave enough to speak up, those who want to put their heads down and get on with it as if things aren't going on, and those who are absolutely determined to bring on their utopian future. And they'll do whatever it takes to do that. Marxism is one of the ideas that brings on the utopia. Unfortunately, it's never worked. It's killed millions. So I think what you've got is essentially a bunch of very unhappy, hard left nutters from the 1970s who are still working in academia. And it's just gone through and they did what they always do, which is they took over the education establishments. So they're teaching children to be activists. They're not teaching them to critically think. Yeah. Now, business is going to have to deal with that reality. And that reality is going to be with us for the next 20 years, at least. So they've got to deal with that reality. And when somebody comes into the workplace, they've got to have that right education starting from the beginning, saying, here's how we roll. We don't do the following. You'll remember the example of Coinbase, who actually said, if you want to do this, we're going to get rid of you. Yeah. And you can go and I'll give you six months salary or whatever it was he did. And it cost him 3% of his, of his 5,000 staff, but he reckons he saved himself millions. Yeah, well, because he, well, he got rid of the revolution ones, but he got rid of the revolution yeah, it, but yeah, it was the ones that went. So it's very much about um, a number of things. And it always sounds when you talk about this as if, as if to do this is to be reactive. Well, actually, there's a very good proactive element which is if you've got ongoing learning for your 
for your employees, whoever they may be, from director right down, then whoever it may be, that's also a great tool for early year retention. Because if they're involved in something that has a group element that is not necessarily connected to work, i.e. they've got colleagues they can talk to, but it's done under Charterhouse rules, Chathamhouse rules, sorry, that there is a, a way of discussing these difficult problems, but outside the workplace, then in essence, you're providing a space for them to do that that is not connected to work, but you're saying, we'll let you do it and we'll pay for it in work time, but you've got to do the rest of the work yourself at home. That's like a collaborative thing between the employee and the employer from the beginning. Yeah. So it, it, you can be proactive here. There's no reason to be reactive. So when we talk about teaching the kinds of stuff we do now, and I'm just writing year three, which is about organization and the organization of humanity through time, and then organizational development and why organizations fall for these now very heavily politicized ideas, which you know as well as I do, come straight from the top. This is nothing to do with collaboration. This is coming from the UNESCO goals. It's coming from um, BlackRock, it's coming from these ESG goals, which they're now trying to foist on everybody. Well, we're going to need a bulwark to say no, because there are little companies going all around all over the place saying, well, you need to be doing this and we can come in and help you do it. And we it only cost this much. So I wanted to come up with something that business could do that was peanuts in comparison to what the cost would be if they didn't do it. Yeah. And so that, that's how the, the winning mindset course developed. And it also meant that from that perspective, the, co the, the company can say, we do the enlightenment, we do freedom of speech within context, we do don't do politics in the worst place, we do don't bring your old self to work, which is just nonsense of first order. <laughs> I never understood I mean, the whole point, why, why would you do well, that? I mean, it's it's bring, bring, well, well, bring your whole self to work is based around mental health, yeah. right? So the idea is you bring your whole self to work and then the, the workplace has to provide mental health care to the employee, which can be outsourced to the mental health industry. So this is a boondoggle, right? It all needs to go. You're in a business to make money. That's it. Now, if you're the NHS, it's a different story because you're actually you actually do want equity. You want equality of outcome not, rather than equality. You give everybody the ability to get the health care, but you want them all to go out as well as possible. So you can do it. But that's not what we're doing when we're saying we want equality of opportunity in business. You can't have equity and equality of opportunity because the two are oil and water. They are they are absolutely the antithesis of each other. So it's fascinating to watch companies grapple with this. But by the time the directors have grappled with it, it's game over. Yeah. Because yeah. this is so deep. You know it as well as I do, Richard. I mean, I've been in this game seven years now. You know as well as I do, this is as deep as it gets. It's so complicated. And when you mention Marxism and Leninism and all the stuff that comes with it, it's not just that. It's every horror of the 20th century. Yeah. Every horror. Yeah. You know, so it's not political. That's the first thing. It's cultural. And what's being used are existing political structures like Marxism. So they've taken the skeleton of Marxism and instead of applying Marxist power and oppression narratives to class, which at the time were needed, they are saying, don't do it about class, do it about race and do it about yeah. gender. Do it about Right. So that's that. And then once you've done that, what they do is they'll say what you need to do is set up an affinity group. So they'll set up, set up an affinity group of people from Israel or people from Pakistan or people from Scotland. And the next thing you know, you've got an LGBTQ affinity group. You do that and you are done. Because you are setting up an activist group in your organization whose only aim would be to make your life a nightmare. Because these people are only interested in power and oppression narratives. And right now, small to medium enterprises are, are like ducks in the open because they literally do not know what they're looking for, for example, when they're recruiting in order to ensure that these individuals don't get a look in. Yeah, I, 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 very... I'm absolutely with you. And of course, one of the great problems with all this is, um, you know, you've got the intellectual argument behind it, and then you've got the practical manifestation of it in the workplace mm -hmm. and in our communities and our societies and associations and everything. And the problem is, is that, the intellectual side is very interesting and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of reasons why this has happened we're not going to talk about them here barry and i could could talk for weeks about this and of course it does involve some some you know some uh a very uh uh, uh, uh radical uh and, and and you know bad political ideas which are mm -hmm. underpinning some of this what what we are noticing though is what we're really concerned about is how this actually impacts you know, Maud, who's running a guest house, or Dave, who owns a pub, or, yeah. you know, Clive, who's got a plumber's company. 
yeah we're trying to work out how that's going to help the, you know how we can help them to protect their businesses and i think one of the things that um you know we we've certainly uh, uh, noticed is that um although this is political there is the element of the old uh, you know i think was it plato who said you know if you don't if you're not interested in politics politics will be interested in you you know it's it's it, it, it's it's that it's that issue here and unfortunately yeah. you know we're now in a situation where in order to protect your business your livelihood and your employees best interests you're going to have to take some actions which we're trying to make as painless as possible for you uh, to to tr just just defend this now one of the things that I wanted to talk about Barry is we know that this is creating real world consequences we've had a report that was carried out by the free speech union which was published in April um, that report was run by Dinata who are an extremely reputable surveying company so you know there's the the, the methodology behind the report is extremely robust because obviously the detractors of the report are trying to sort of dismiss it as nonsense and scaremongering but that report indicates some very interesting things. First of all, what Dinata did is they took 800 workers, and these were people who are employed. So they're not self-employed, they're not retired, they're not students, they're people who are actually working. And then they asked them if they, and then they made sure that these people had had some form of EDI or quality diversity and, and, and uh, inclusion training, either in their current job or in their previous job. And the two things that were really interesting here were that uh, it indicated that 61% of the UK population has had this type of training, yet 62% of people work in SMEs. So the question you've got to ask yourself is why the hell are SMEs training people in EDI when SMEs, in my experience, will only ever train people uh, on training courses that they absolutely have to have to implement and of course the answer is because the edi has been pushed on them by esg policies from their customers nhs well it, it, it actually gets darker than that it's not simply it's just that they're now going to have a trouble finding banking or they're going to have trouble obtaining a grant or they're going to have trouble obtaining a loan if they don't do this yeah. because it's so embedded in the larger organizations and you highlight a very very difficult problem one that I've come across a couple of times and that you can actually deal with if you use as the model, surprisingly enough, the public sector equality duty. Now, the public sector equality duty applies to the NHS, DWP, you know, external bodies that are connected to the government. But it's certainly a template that can be used by SMEs in order to look at how they deal with, with what is essentially die, as I call it, um, rather than EDI. Yeah. Because neither of them are now fit for purpose, even though EDI had the best intentions in the world when it started. They're not, neither of them are fit for purpose. They've all been, they've all been hijacked by nonsense merchants and power and oppression wallers. So we are in a situation where the organization has to say to itself, what do we stand for? Well, I think that's, you're back to, if, if they've been unanchored, because think about it this way, if you're an organization and you've got 500 employees and you've been unanchored, right? Or there's people in your organization that anchor you. It doesn't matter if you've got 50 or 500, to be honest then you've got to reestablish the anchor. And the best way to reestablish the anchor in a world that is going to be completely steeped in information and knowledge is to reestablish the anchor from an educational perspective. And my argument is that every organization becomes an educational organization. It's going to have to, because it's the only way we're going to keep up with the speed of change. That's a theory which I happen to ascribe to because I made it up, that I nicked from biology that I call tech punctuated equilibrium which is where for 80% of the time, nothing happens. And 20% of the time we go batshit crazy. And the, we're in the 20% and that will last a hundred and more years. Wow. So they need to get their head around the fact that sitting back and doing nothing is not going to be the way. So they need something effective in order to establish what is the anchor of their business. And that anchor needs to be that education is paramount. The enlightenment is paramount. Free speech within the context of work is paramount. No politicization is paramount. Okay. And that you don't, bring your whole self to work. What you do is you behave in a professional way. And here we prescribe what that professional way is. They, they really are going to have to do this. They've got to go back to the beginning. And the second thing is that many companies, if they're in that sort of bracket between 25 people and 100 people, which is a really crucial bracket, you know that as well as I do, they will quite often not have a framework for growth that's effective. 
So I've seen people with 25 employees go to 30, 35, and then drop back to 25. They can't get over that hurdle because they don't have the correct framework. Well, you can build all this into your organizational framework yeah. without any trouble at all. It would take time. You know, it takes a good two years to get it done properly in an organization that size. But it's something they should be doing. But we've got to get that base route right. And that base route in the world that we're going into must be educational. Now, businesses will then say to me, we've got nothing to do with education. Oh, yeah, you have. Yeah, you and have the to. reason you have it, because it doesn't matter whether you're serving fish and chips or whether you're 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 doing plumbing or electrics or whether you're actually helping people with sales. The world is going at such a speed and tech is going at such a speed that learning is now your partner. It is no longer something you do just when it's convenient. And I think this directly addresses, from my perspective, what you said about small to medium enterprises. I've got the money to spend a fortune on people learning. It's in set the corporates can do all this, you know, sit around and have coffee stuff and listen to some twit talk about what type of learner you are. Are you a visual or auditory or kinesthetic learner? You remember all that nonsense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, what are the problems? If that's true, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. If that's true, where are the old, where are the old factory learners that learn by sniffing? It's yeah. just nonsense, and we need to stop it. We need to get back to education and forget this psycho babble that came out of the 50s and 60s. And organizations need to be able to do that cheaply. So the idea is that you have a pact with your employee and you say, look, we'll pay for it. You can do it on two hours on a Friday, two hours on a Tuesday morning, but you do the homework in your own time, right? You do what works required in your own time, and it shouldn't be onerous. So you do a couple of hours on a Friday, and over the month, you do maybe two or three hours of reading. That's that's what it should be, but it should be regularized and it should involve discussions around why the company has that educational route and that philosophical standpoint, meritocracy, the Enlightenment, John Locke, John, all the all the stuff you and I know has given us the most successful world we've ever seen in terms of our standard of living, far greater than our great grandparents ever had, Richard. Yeah. And I think that business needs to get its head around this. And I know that you and the team have got your head around it. We just need business to get its head around it. And I think that's only going to start from the top. So it's the MD. I've had terrible trouble getting to the MDs. You can't get to the MDs. You can't get to them. So, so here's an interesting thing. Here's an interesting thing, which might fill you with some hope. Is that since the publication of the cash report, we've started to see the conversation opening up on LinkedIn. Now, um, about eight weeks ago, I had an article published on the Daily Skeptic under my nom de guerre, or as my wife calls it, my Mr. Hyde, uh, C.J. Strachan. <laughs> and C.J. Wonderful. Strachan rants more than he writes, but C.J. Strachan, who is my alter ego, had written an article basically taking a piss out of LinkedIn, saying that LinkedIn had lost any value and was now a Maoist indoctrination on self-criticism session combined with some sort of obnoxiously cheesy self-congratulation uh, platform. However, yeah. that very afternoon, my wife sent me a link to a post on LinkedIn, which completely undermined my entire argument because it was a really important post. And <laughs> it, it was an important post because there are a number of disruptors who are emerging in the human resources world. So I'm talking about people like Simon Fanshawe. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about people like uh, Lynn Killick up in Edinburgh. And mm -hmm. uh, people like uh, Tanya de, de Gronvald in, in London, and um, there's a group of us who are who have now started to open up the conversation on LinkedIn, and for the first time in as long as I can remember, we're now having conversations about things like how you do EDI better, how you sort, how, how you remove politics from the workplace, how you cope with uh, with gender critical uh, versus trans rights issues at work, how you manage workplace conflicts. And all these other little little snippets. And what's so fascinating is we're now getting support from senior executives and HR directors in particular who know that there's been a cock up here. And yeah. I think it's important to understand that the I, mean, I don't want to go into too much here. There's we've actually covered this in some in some length, or sort of say Mr. Strachan has covered this in some length on, on some of his substack and in the step in the skeptic around why this has happened. And and because the road to hell, of course, is is paved with good intentions. I mean, we're not. Always. There aren't tw moustache twiddling, you know, no. Stalinists out there in the background pulling pulling cables here. There's a few of them, yeah, yeah. but yeah. actually, this is you know, organisations and humanity is a big organisation now. Will unless you unless you steer the culture of that organisation, they'll very quickly 
get dragged down a rabbit hole. And that seems, I think, what's happening with it, with Western culture at the moment. And it's, it's, it, if you speak to the, the people who are who are um, responsible for implementing a lot of this stuff, they're very nice people. They think of course they are. They think they're doing the right thing, but they, they haven't do. thought through the consequences of what yeah. they're doing or why this it's is, not a good I, idea. Well, so, this is this is. The, the one, this is soldiers in Ipsen, isn't it? With the good it eyes. is soldiers, yeah. And, and of course, the, the one thing I would say that may give you some hope is that um, one of these uh, HR people, uh, HR consultants, said to me the other day, so her business basically does what we do, but does it for larger organizations. Five years ago, her clients were, uh, sorry, 10 years ago, her clients were, were HR directors, Five years ago, her clients were EDI directors or EDI managers. Now her clients are CEOs. Right. And the That's CEOs, good to hear. Yeah. And the CEOs are saying to her, I need you to come and fix our HR department. They're, they're out of control. We've got employee yeah, yeah. tribunals yeah. all over the place. We've got yeah. employees that are disengaged. We've got, we've got massive problems around workplace, about staff turnover. And the HR department, they, they seem to be the ones who are instigating half of this. I need you to come and fix that's it. That's right. That's correct. This yeah. is fascinating because you want to know something else that's really interesting. Do you know the sector she works in? Academia and those clients, yeah. universities. Oh, now, that's interesting. I think that I've said it a, a hundred times before that it will. It started in the ivory towers, but it will end in the streets. Yeah. Because when the common man gets their, gets their head around what's happened, there is going to be anger. Now, that anger should be tempered, as you have said, by the fact that these people are doing to what they're doing with the best of intentions. But as with the guards in the Gulag, who ended up living in the same building as the people they'd imprisoned, when they discovered what they'd done was actually nothing to do with good at all, they committed suicide en masse. I mean, it was extraordinary, period, that soldiers in it and wrote about. And I think that we need to understand that, that Hanlon's razor applies, which is that never put down to wickedness that you can ascribe to stupidity. In the people, we're not used to thinking deeply anymore, Richard. Yeah. That's been drummed out of us. It's really interesting in, do, in the work that I do with young people in my community to talk to them at depth. I mean, they, they, they're they enthralled. They don't get it at all. Nobody does it with them. So I'm like, and how does that work? You know, you're doing that kind of Socratic questioning. You're learning yeah, how yeah. to communicate with each other why? in a learning way. Asking why. Why is that? Why do we think that way? Why is this a good idea? Why are we That's doing fast. this? The seven whys. Was that Disney or was Disney the hats? I can't remember. It was, do you remember all the stuff they used to teach years ago? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, spent, I spent some time debunking the training that's being carried out, and most of it is absolute rubbish. It's extraordinary to look back on my career now as a, as a teacher and an educator in business and elsewhere and see that the vast majority of what I teach him was unevidence crap. But that's what we've allowed to happen. Now we need to look at stuff from the point of view of if it is something that is a... A, a, perhaps a, a, an idea rather than a, a fact we should call it that instead of going in and saying right here we go now seven percent of your communication is verbal the 49 percent of it is body language and and the rest is all about god knows what which turned out to be a load of rubbish it was never true never true and we've taught every single individual in the damn country about that nonsense the same goes for the change thing oh it's anger denial bargaining depression cobblers it's absolute rubbish. It's got no validity at all. But it was taught as fact. So we built, we built, we've made people fragile. We have built fragility into the system because we've taken psychological ideas that are designed for people who are fragile and need to understand their world. And we've made that normality. So we yeah. can't underestimate the absolute danger of behaviorist psychology to businesses. And that's the predominant nature of what is happening to businesses right now is behaviorist psychology. And that's very worrying because that means you're nudging your employees. You're not bringing them with you. You're pushing them ahead of you. It's so, it's social never social engineering. It's, it's never, it never, yeah. never, ever works. And, um, you know, uh, I remember, uh, you know, 30 years ago, um, well, I mean, I started my, my career as a grubby salesman. Um, you know, I never, I never ended up, you know, set up, set up to end up as some sort of HR numpty. I started off, and there's nothing like sales to be as, as an honest trade, you know. Absolutely right. You got, you got to hit your target, you're fired. End of, end yeah. of. And that's funnily exactly enough, actually, And funnily enough, actually, it's a, it, it still does have that to an extent in some in, in, in some areas. But one of the things that we used to be well into back in the 90s was neuro-linguistic programming. Oh, don't get me started. 
<laughs> and the amount of okay. money that was spent on NLP. Oh, um, you know, what's, which what's the other one where you where you where you could well, they'll tell you your personality? Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs. Oh, God, I mean, people are still doing it, and all these young people have got this in their headers on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, well, what are you doing with that? I mean, I know, did you know how neuro linguistic programming became known? The name, do you know how it was named? No, I don't know that bit. There was a stack of books sitting on his car seat, and he just took words from the books and named it. <laughs> it never had any validity, it has no validity, it's absolute rubbish from beginning to end. But why did I do your dad you know, do your damn job? Ross you know? <laughs> it's, I mean, we all fell for it. Yeah. It's not like this is anything new. Well, well, well I mean, right. when, you're, when you're a salesman, you desperately try to look for something to, you know, you in, especially in Britain, where sales yeah. is treated with such contempt. Yeah. Uh, it's our uh, job. Then, then you're looking for something to intellectualize or validate what you're doing. So you can then sit at the same table as the bean counters and the engineers. Yeah, yeah. And the, it, which is insane because without you, they wouldn't have a damn job. Well, exactly. What always, what always amazes it. me, I mean, the, the amazing thing now is. What we have now that you and I didn't have when I was out knocking doors bloody when I was a kid, right? What we, what we have now that we didn't have is we've now got the ability to look back and research what it is that's going on and understand where it went wrong. This is why education becomes so important because somebody will come to the company and go, right, here, we're going to have a look at this. This is really good. We're going to do this management training, leadership training, and the company should be able to go, right, call the HR folks and look into this. Tell us whether this is actually worthwhile doing. And then, you know, they'll pay you whatever it may be. And you do two or three hours research and go back with, OK, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. That's OK, but that's nonsense. And if any of it's nonsense, you dismiss it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and right? I think that's it. It's not, oh, it's only a bit of it's nonsense. If any of it is nonsense, you dismiss it. If it's, if it's pretending to be real, it, they can say there is a theory. But they have to say there is a theory. There's a theory, yeah. And, and that's what the trouble is, is, that, is the almost didactic nature of you will believe this and you will behave this way. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I can actually, uh, I mean, just to segue slightly, I'm conscious of time, but just to segue slightly, um, when one of the reasons why this came in, and if you read uh, the excellent Mr. Dracken's article on uh, uh, part two, uh, sorry, part one of his, of his article about how EDI took over the British workplace, Mm -hmm. uh, I'll bug a link somewhere below. But basically, um, like everything, the world to, to, to hell is paved with good intentions. 2020 was when EDI was turbocharged and became ubiquitous. And it happened because yeah, yeah. of the George Floyd situation. Yeah, yeah. And you had suddenly had a situation where HR departments, which were absolutely groaning under the responsibility, trying to get things like furlough and distance working and all this nonsense in place. Mm -hmm were suddenly told by our boards of directors that we needed to introduce, we needed to do something about the George Floyd situation. Um, we had to do something. And we had this, you know? this huge demand suddenly, rather than pushing back at the, at the boss and going, look, just, you know, what's our business? They said, oh, oh all right, all right. And, and, and so they went out and they bought stuff. There was, there was a huge demand for EDI training. There was a huge demand for EDI managers. It, it just went through the roof. And, of course, when you get a huge demand very quickly, quality goes down. And yes. so I remember uh, looking at uh, an EDI training uh, 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 tra training plan that had been put in at the time. And it was about um, – it was talking about structural racism, okay? And wow. what had happened is that some grifters had literally gone to some American website and lifted it a whole training course about yep. about racism in the workplace and then just basically copied it over. And I said, well, that, that, would, that would have been anti-racism, Richard, which well, is yeah, totalitarian. Yeah. That's totalitarian. That's pure Maoism. Well, well, it, it, absolutely. And the funniest thing about this, you, you'll laugh at this because, because the salesperson was saying, Oh, so, you know, the so second module is, is about uh, how, how um, segregation laws have driven systemic racism. And I sort of went, hold on, can I just stop you there? Yeah. I said, what segregation laws? I said, you know, I'm a historian, okay? I know the history of this country pretty well, and I do know that we've never had segregation laws in this country, unless you're talking about the segregation laws that were introduced in the 16th century, early 16th century, to stop Scots and English living on the borders, marrying with each other because of the organised crime problem in the area at the time. Yeah. It's just, it's, That's the only time we've had segregation laws. I mean, they, but, but they make these statements, and then when they make these statements, if you're in the workplace and you go, excuse me, they'll have you. They'll go back and say you've got a racist in your midst, exactly. right? Because it's all about power and oppression and black and white thinking. What we need to do is ensure that organizations are teaching people in shades of gray. We want uncertainty, not certainty. The only certainty should be 
our end result is to make money. We're going to create a good product. We're going to create great customer service. And internally, we're going to have great people to support each other. That's the message. And that doesn't need to be tainted by, oh, it's structural racism or whatever, or queer theory or whatever it is that they're pulling in. I mean, let alone the fact that so many of these companies, particularly the big ones, are now pushing an extremely homophobic and misogynistic agenda. And they don't even know it. Yeah. Yep. It's extraordinary to me. It, it was the same when BLM arrived and I got a phone call from a client saying, what the hell is this? Shut down STEM. That was hashtag shut down STEM, right? Where they were going to shut down STEM for the day. I think this client who was a university came to me and said, what the hell is this? I said, give me two hours and I'll get back to you. And I, I got back to them and then they got the students on who were wanting to shut down STEM for the day so they could learn about black oppression, right? And, and thousands did. Thousands of universities shut down for the day. It was incredible. Cost millions. Turns out the whole damn thing came from two queer activists in New York and was retreated by Ben Shapiro and 30,000 academics in the UK signed it within four hours. This kind of credulity can no longer be tolerated in workplaces. We must say to people that you've got to learn to think on a much more critical level. You've got to think much more deeply. What do you think? What do you know? What can you prove? And they need to be having conversations in the workplace that are rich in meaning than that not just simply are about branding, which is not only the branding of the company, which is important, but the brand that they themselves wish to show. Yeah. So when people say, bring your whole self to work, that will be bring your whole self to work as long as you're the brand we want you to be. It won't be me sat on the couch farting and picking me toes, right? It won't. It will be <laughs> the, one, the one we want you to be. So in other words, we've got to stop this, this process that people are going through currently, even before they get to work, of thinking of themselves as a brand whose life they curate. It's very worrying. Um, but business is going to have to pick up the slack, I think, on this from an education. How, how much do you think social media is driving this idea of people people presenting themselves as a brand? Well, 100%. Well, exactly, yeah. Exactly. You know as well as I do, we, we had the flash hours years ago, right? And they'd come into sales, and it didn't matter who they were. They'd come in, and they'd be like, oh, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. And they had all the right clothes and all the right – you remember the 80s? Yeah. You know, yeah. the 200 business cards. And then six weeks later, they hadn't sold a damn thing, and they were gone. And yet the little old guy in the corner who never said boo to a goose sat there smoking his pipe was at the top of the sales charts, yeah. right? For a very long time indeed, business in this country has confused competence with confidence, yeah. and it has to stop. It yeah. has to stop. And competent, part of the competence that business now needs is an ability to either A, be able to think deeply, or B, being prepared to look at a wide enough vista to learn how to. Absolutely. Okay. And as you'll see, I have my pipe here. You have your peep? I have my peep. And uh, I, I, could not, I could not agree more. Um, the, the, um, I, I am conscious that we're into 41 minutes. I, I think, think that's, that's more than, than enough. enough. Okay. There's an awful lot more to unpack, uh, but what there I will is. say yeah. is that is that we'll be uh, we, we are very happy to announce that we will be working more with Barry in the future. We've got things I'm we need to discuss good. and work out. But yeah. what we're trying going to try and do is take some of his expertise around this, recombobulate it so it's quite straightforward to get into your business environment, so you can do this painlessly and affordably to protect your company against the possible. Uh, things that can happen to it because like just like living your life in any 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 uh, way these days this day and age you could be just bumbling along and the world can land on you and and if you don't believe me i can give you war stories of a dozen clients today who have found themselves being almost forced out of business because they've lost employment tribunals from from nefarious claims from activist employees who've weaponized the equalities act against them and it's devastated the lives of these people. These are small business owners who who just want to run their guest houses, yeah. you know, run run their pubs, and Absolutely. they're suddenly exposed to the full glare of of full on internet activism. And the sad thing is, it doesn't just cost them their business; it costs the other employees their jobs. Well, and their reputations, and their reputation. And 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 it's 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 absolutely appalling and it's nefarious. Now we can't. It's a rely, struggle session. Exactly. It's a struggle session. We can't rely on the state to to to, to stop this. The Tories are in power for fourteen yeah. years and yeah. they did nothing. Yeah. Nothing. They're not going to stop it. So so the only people who can stop it is for the grown ups to take the wheel again. Yes. And and, and we, we do it one person at a time. 
and we do it one person at a time and we do it one business at a time and we get there. So yeah, I think we should wrap it up, Barry. Um, I agree. Let's get you back soon because I think there's an awful yeah. lot more to unpack here and there's a lot more to Absolutely. talk about. Um, I hope you bear with us about the sort of camera and uh, bandwidth issues and things, but I think the most important thing is the audio has been captured, which is the most important yeah. thing here. Uh, we yeah. will put it up as a video anyway, because people like to watch our ugly mugs and uh, for of some strange reason. But uh, um, I would like to say that if any, if any of this strikes a, strikes a chord with anybody, please get in touch with either ourselves or with Barry. Um, details will be below. There'll be a link to get Barry's Substack below. There's also links to our locals and to uh, the Fair Job Initiative. And go on there, have a look, give us some feedback, let us know what you think. Um, is there anything else to add, Barry? No, I, th I think we're about there. I would, I, I probably would like to add, don't confuse me with the EDI jester. He's a different ball game altogether. <laughs> but, like, you know what it's like, but you've got your CJ Strachan. You know, people will say to me when they meet me, you're nothing like the EDI jester. And I'm like, well, go figure. Yeah. You know, the EDI jester was something that was invented a few years back in order to poke power. It's not something where, you know, it's not no, absolutely. And, 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 seriously. And, so, and course, uh, yeah, I would say that. This is this is one of the things that's that's not only really important to understand, but really challenging for organizations like ours. One of the things that drives me to distraction about what is loosely defined as the right, which I don't think is right at all, actually. I think it's just normal people wanting to have a voice, is that we are great at talking about problems, but we're rubbish at doing anything about it. Yeah. Now, what the Fair Job Initiative and what the Warrior Teachers Organization was set up to do was to take, actually do some bloody action here to push back, to fight back, to secure our future for ourselves and our children and our communities. Now, yeah. it, by all means, sit there, listen to all the very interesting people on YouTube or binge on Rumble or whatever, as long as you want. But please, you must understand, you have to take action. And even if that is just literally sharing this video, or, or subscribing to to us don't even want your money just take some action do so, a little thing because if enough of us normal people out there do these little things then the pushback will be enormous and as barry said as well and i happen to agree with him on this there's a lot of people out like there who like to like to point at people and scream far right now unless we as a society start to fix our society then we will see the far right and the far right is called reactionary for a very, very good reason. So if you really want a Gus Pinochet in charge, if you really want a Caudillo Franco, then this is the way to go, guys. Just keep pushing. Alternatively, you can maybe think about the fact we all have a responsibility to the society we live in. We all have a responsibility to create a truly inclusive society where people's views and views and different, different opinions are tolerated by everybody. And where we're here to look out for each other and to show some bloody compassion based around the values that we have that Barry's been talking about. What are those values again, Barry? Well, uh, meritocracy. Yep. Meritocracy is one, a very important one. Compassion itself is a very important one, but, but real compassion. And I would say that you're looking at things like inclusive, inclusivity of, of, of different viewpoints. Not It's got nothing to do with who you are. Yep. It's got to do with the viewpoints that can help move people forward. So that would be part of it. So diversity of thought, you know, and it's all those types. Of, I mean, if you want to be included, turn up. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, we've gone on a bit longer, longer than we wanted to, but that's not a problem because it's all very interesting. And well, we like things. So. so we do. Do follow us. And if you've got any questions, bung them down below, subscribe to the various sub stacks and subscribe to the various locals. We'd be very, very grateful. And in the meantime, it is goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Thanks.